Hey everybody, thanks for stopping by. In this video series, I'm going to show you exactly how I set up this innovative marine 40 gallon all-in-one reef tank. Hopefully I can help you avoid some of the many mistakes I've made over the years. One thing I've learned is that there are always new things to learn from every tank you build. I'm going to assume that you are new to the reefing hobby or you are interested in building your first reef tank. Even if you are experienced with saltwater aquariums or an old reefing pro, you may learn something new or you may have suggestions that might help improve the way I do things. Either way, welcome to the channel and I hope you enjoy this video. Now why did I choose this tank? Well I've never set up a tank without a sump before and people seem to like these all-in-ones. And I think 40 gallons is a perfect size for a new reefer. With smaller tanks it can be difficult to keep your water parameters consistent and larger tanks with sumps can be a bit overwhelming for someone new to the hobby. I'll build progressively larger tanks in later videos and smaller tanks too. But for now I'd like to focus on showing the basics in a relaxed, non-threatening way for beginners. I'll cover all of the equipment I'm using in an upcoming video. But in the meantime, I'd be glad to answer any questions about that in the comments below. The first thing that will help you start off on the right foot is tank placement. Where should you put your tank? Well, keep in mind that aquariums filled with water are extremely heavy. So plan ahead because moving it later to a di different location will be a giant pain in the ass. The biggest mistake I see people make is placing their tank too close to the wall. It's a bitch to get behind it for maintenance or dealing with a leak or access to your outlets. So you definitely want to leave plenty of space between your tank and your wall. Also, you don't want your tank to receive direct sunlight. This will cause nuisance algae growth and possibly trouble with temperature extremes. If you do have to place your tank in the path of direct sunlight, you'll want to use good blackout curtains and keep them closed in the heat of the day. And do yourself a favor, don't put your tank too far from your water source. You will get tired of lugging five gallon buckets of water right quick. Fortunately, I had room just outside my studio for this tank that allows me 360 degree access comfortably. That has really been a blessing with this type of all-in-one tank. So now that you've decided where your tank will be and have it set up, let's start with the basics. The best advice I ever got about keeping reef tanks is to remember that you aren't so much keeping animals as you are keeping a box of water. As long as your water is right, supplying the needs of your livestock is the easy part of the hobby. Put another way, the only way to keep a successful reef tank is to maintain pristine water. And the very best way to do that is by using reverse osmosis, deionized water, or RODI water. Whenever someone is having a problem with their tank, the first question that is always asked, or should be asked, is what kind of water are you using? Nearly all problems with your reef can be traced to your source water. You can either purchase salt water from your local fish store, which I don't recommend, or you can make your own which I've found to be more efficient, while allowing you more control over water quality. Now there are many different RODI units on the market, some better than others. I use this Aquatic Life four-stage RODI unit. It costs just over 100 bucks and comes with everything you need to install it under your sink in about 20 minutes. Seriously, I have no handyman skills whatsoever, and that's how long it took me. You can also use it as a portable unit and just attach it to your faucet whenever you need to make water. Using RODI water will help you avoid 90% of the problems that will arise in your reef. Now let's talk about salt. There's a lot of debate in the hobby about which salt is best, and at the risk of ruffling a few feathers, there's just no need to pay boutique prices for the latest, greatest pro reef salt. I've been using plain old Instant Ocean since the 80s and have never had a problem with bad salt. Instant Ocean will keep all your major, minor, and trace elements in check and you'll be able to keep a healthy and successful reef. If you truly believe that reef salt with the word pro in front of it gives you an advantage and you don't mind paying significantly more for your salt, then by all means do so. But I really believe that this is one area where you can save money while not sacrificing chances for success. Now let's discuss rock and sand. Rock and sand are your most important biological filtration. Back in the day, we would just build a big ass wall of live rock against the back of the tank and pour in some live sand and hope for the best. Using anything but live rock was unheard of. The drawback was having to deal with all sorts of pests that come in on live rock, not to mention the cost. I remember paying $12 to $15 a pound for premium Fiji or Marshall Island rock 30 years ago. It was great stuff, lightweight, highly porous, 
Lots of coralline algae and just teeming with life. But oftentimes it was the kind of life you really don't want in your tank. Over the years I've battled everything from nuisance algae to hydroids and fireworms and mantis shrimp, predatory snails and crabs and aptasia and every kind of creepy, stinging, biting, snotty little reef bastard you can think of, and none of them are any fun. Now I use only dry rock for my tanks, and I'd encourage you to do so. I do use a small piece or two of well-cured live rock that I have carefully inspected during cycling just to help jumpstart the biofilter. Let's talk about sand. Don't cut corners on sand, get something good. You can get it live or dry, I really don't think it matters as far as establishing your bacteria. I feel like the benefits of live sand versus dry sand might be overhyped. Your mileage may vary, but the best I've found is this Tropic Eden brand. It is extremely clean, easy to rinse, and looks great. I'm using the Tropic Eden Tonga Mini Flakes. There is a fairly recent trend of going with a bare bottom tank for ease of maintenance, but unless you are farming coral to sell or maintaining a frag tank, a nice clean sand bed just looks better and more natural to me. It also provides lots of surface area for beneficial bacteria and habitat for copepods and amphipods that are vital for your ecosystem. Now let's talk about rockscaping. There are only a couple of rules when it comes to building your rock structure. You want to leave a couple inches between your rock and the glass so that your algae magnet has room to move freely when cleaning your glass. And you want as few contact points as possible at the bottom of your tank to minimize dead areas that can create problems in the future. Other than that, just use your own creativity to make something that looks natural and more importantly, something that looks good to you. Also, try to leave open spaces for water to flow through and around your rocks and make plenty of caves and areas for fish to hide and create sleeping areas, just as they would on a natural coral reef. One thing people often overlook when building their rockscape is coral placement. Plan ahead and make ledges and flat spots to hold certain types of corals. Also take into account the different lighting and water flow needs of the types of corals you plan to keep and build places for them in appropriate areas on your reef. Now how do you hold your rocks together and create a stable structure? Well there are lots of different glues and epoxies and cement products available to secure your rockscape. It's really up to you what works best and looks best. What I've used for years and what I recommend is JB Water Weld Epoxy. It is completely safe for your reef, it's inexpensive, dries an off-white color, and bonds dry rock better than anything else I've used. Always wear gloves when working with this stuff. It's not really toxic or anything, but it is a bitch to get off your hands once it dries. Now after you've placed your rock and sand in your aquarium, in that order for stability, and filled your tank with salt water at a specific gravity of 1.025 to 1.026, it's time for the most important aspect of establishing a successful reef aquarium. Cycling your tank. If you were to ask 10 different reefers the best way to cycle your reef, you might get 10 different answers, and they may all be right. In order to establish the necessary bacteria within your rocks and sand bed, you need a source of ammonia to feed the bacteria. Traditionally, this has been done by either throwing in a hardy fish like a damsel that can survive high levels of ammonia while your bacteria is established, or by throwing in a piece of raw shrimp and letting it break down. Some old school reefers would just drop their zipper and pee in the tank for an ammonia source. Now, I would not recommend the PP method for various and obvious reasons. There are a couple of important rules to remember while your tank is cycling. Number one is to leave your lights off. I know it's tempting to turn on your badass new lights on your badass new tank to admire your cool new aquascape, but you will avoid lots of problems with algae down the line if you cycle your tank in the dark. And number two is to use only your mechanical media while cycling. Don't use your skimmer or any sort of chemical media while you cycle. It's not the end of the world if you do, but it will increase the chances of stalling your cycle, which can be frustrating and lead to a longer cycling time. Now the best way I've found to cycle a reef tank is to use bacteria in a bottle. And the best I've used is Turbo Start 9000 by Fritz Aquatics. It is the only bottled bacteria I've found that also includes a necessary sort of carbon to eat up your ammonia efficiently and feed your bacteria. Plenty of people have successfully cycled their tanks with products like Dr. Tim's One and Only and Byrospira from Instant Ocean and all of these products will work, but I've found the Fritz product to be the most reliable. 
Turbo Start is a refrigerated product and you want to keep it refrigerated until you are ready to use it. You want to get the correct size bottle for your tank. However, there really is no danger of overdosing, so I'd suggest using it liberally. This stuff absolutely works and it will cut your cycle time from 6 to 8 weeks down to a couple of weeks. This tank cycled in 12 days. To feed the bacteria, I used pure ammonium chloride. On day 13, I introduced a pair of clownfish and they are eating, happy, and thriving. And the next major event after adding your fish, if it hasn't happened already because you just couldn't resist running your lights, is the dreaded ugly stage of a new tank. You will have a diatom algae bloom that will turn your rocks and sand brown, and you will get film algae, green hair algae, turf algae, and you will see green algae on your glass. And if you're really lucky, you'll get some red or brown slimy looking shit, and your tank will just look like hell. It is at this point that you want to go ahead and break down your system and sell it for pennies on the dollar on Craigslist and take up knitting or tennis or something. Okay, not really. Don't do that. In the next video, I will show you how to get rid of all that mess with a cleanup crew and wave pumps and prepare your tank for livestock. Again, thanks for stopping by. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you've learned something. And I hope you'll follow along and watch this tank grow out and mature. If you'd like to follow the process, just hit subscribe and click on the bell so you will receive notification when a new video is released. If you have any questions or just want to talk smack, comment below. Don't be bashful, and I'd be happy to help in any way I can. And until next time, be nice to each other out there and try to have some fun with this thing.